Thank you very much indeed for coming. Uh, on a nice night like this, if it's still sunny out there, thank you for coming indoors. That's very kind of you. Uh, if it's raining outside yet, uh, I've been here for a while, thank you for coming out in the rain. Uh, it's very nice to see you, except that I can't, of course. <laughs> Just about see one or two pairs of specs reflecting in the light, and that's it, so I trust you're all there. Uh, I'd also like to thank Chesterfield Borough Council uh, for inviting me to speak this evening as part of the events that are being arranged for uh, a way of marking the 750th anniversary of the Battle of Chesterfield. So I'm here as an enthusiast. I did a history degree a long time ago. Uh, I spent most of the time since then being a primary school teacher, uh, teaching in Chesterfield here, and uh, I play some music, more of that later. Uh, I keep an allotment, go bird watching, all sorts of things like that. Um, but yes, I'm definitely enthusiastic about this event, this 750th anniversary. So the first part of the evening is going to be a talk about the historical background, the 13th century, and the battle itself. And then, as it said on the flyer, the second part is an update on the plans that we have for marking the anniversary in May later this year. That's going to be the all seeing, all dancing bit. You had some evidence of that earlier. So, uh, that's where we're heading towards. And I want to tell a story this evening in the first part. I want to tell the story of why King Henry III's nephew, Prince Henry of Almain, why did he come to Chesterfield in May 1266 with an army? Wasn't a market day, wasn't a match up. He came to Chesterfield with a lot of people. And that's what I want to tell. And there is so much to tell. I had a really great time researching this. Uh, the 13th century is not well known, uh, although Henry III reigned for 54 years, almost well, just over half of it. Uh, really, there are no major films, major books, major plays, stories about the 13th century. So it's a bit of a dark period in English history, and I've had great fun learning about it. We're going to try and tell you some of that. Uh, some of the stuff I couldn't fit into the talk this evening, uh, I made notes on, and if you want, you can look at my lecture notes and the references for where I found some of this stuff, uh, and they're on the Chesterfield 750 website, so if you want to find out more of the stuff there. It was all about power and control in the 13th century. The Second Barons War, of which the Battle of Chesterfield was a small final event, uh, it's just one of the whole sequence of, of occasions when baronial families in England fought for power and control in England. Rebellions, conflicts over who should rule occurred constantly in the, in the medieval period. You can think of William I, William the Conqueror, very soon after he got here, earls in the north of England rebelled against the way he was running the country. His son William was probably murdered by another group of barons who wanted to change what was going on. Henry I, he had another revolt of barons to cope with as well, led by one Amory of Montfort. And that Montfort name is the name we're going to come back to later this evening. Then there was the anarchy of the reign of King Stephen and his rivalry with Matilda. And then Henry II is often considered a strong king and to put up with his own sons, aiding the letting by his wife, giving him grief as well. And when son John, uh, Richard rather made it to the throne, King John, or rather John to be King John, was busy intriguing against Richard while he was away on crusade. It never seemed to settle down. And we come to the First Barons' War, which brought John's reign to an end. And again, we'll come to the Second Barons' War later, but we'll start off near the beginning of the 13th century with the end of the reign of King John. And the Second Barons' War wasn't the end of it either. We've got all the Wars of the Roses still to come. So there's plenty of conflict and debate and argument about how to run this country. Because with power and control comes wealth. The political orthodoxy of the time was that the country should be ruled by a monarch. He would be divinely appointed, and the king was seen as a necessary centre point. Debate, argument, conflict was about kingship, about how the king 
ruled his kingdom, not about whether there should be a king at all. For example, in 1215, when King John set his seal to Magna Carta, the barons still expected him to be king, to remain on the throne. And when he subsequently so spectacularly failed to live up to Magna Carta, it was renounced by the Pope within weeks of its being sealed, uh, the barons then thought, we need, another, we need a king, a different king, but we still need a king. And they asked Prince Louis, the king of the southern king of France, to be king. They also even asked, or considered asking, Alexander II of Scotland to be king of England. Uh, but they thought that Louis was probably a better uh, prospect. Uh, many barons in those days held land both on this side of the Channel and in France. And if uh, King John, who was nicknamed Lightlands, had managed to lose some of those lands in his reign, uh, maybe the barons might get them back if Louis took the crown. So in May 1216, Louis invaded England. 800 years ago? 150 years ago after, 150 years after Hastings. And his invasion was nearly a repeat of 1066. At one point, Louis and the rebellious barons controlled London and half of England. It could easily have been another 1066. But John's death in 1216 gave the barons the excuse uh, to come back to the crown side. John was really the reason why the barons were fed up, and with his death, uh, that gave him an excuse to stop opposing the throne. What mattered to the barons was not so much who wore the throne, but that somebody wore it, because the king with the barons would make a coalition that would run the country, and the barons would then benefit from that coalition in terms of getting power, positions, uh, wealth, lands, titles, all those things would, would enable them to become powerful as well. And if the king couldn't maintain that coalition, if he lost it and it fell apart, as happened to Henry III in the Second Barons' War, then he was in trouble. Initially, because he was only nine when he came to the throne, it fell to Ranulph, Earl of Chester, and William Marshall to restore royal authority. That was easier said than done. Even though John was dead, still there were rebellious nobles out in the countryside. Uh, remember, half of the country was controlled by the French at that time. But John's death doomed the rebels' cause. Matthew Paris is one of the chroniclers of that time. He actually drew pictures on his chronicle as well, all written in Latin, but he actually illustrated them. And in 1217, May 1217, so after John had died, but while Henry was still uh, very young, nine years old, uh, the Royal Army marched to Lincoln to try and raise the siege of the castle. The French had invested and attacked the castle there, and Marshal led the royal forces in and drove the French army away. The, uh, uh, it was fighting in the streets of Lincoln, and another chronicler, Roger Wendover, says, that there were sparks and thunder from clashing metal and the sound of swords against helmets. There's unfortunately no such description of the Battle of Chesterfield. But that might give you a bit of a, an idea of what was going to happen on the streets of this town in 1266. The leader of the French forces was killed when a blade entered the, the eyepiece of his helmet and was stabbed through the eye there drawn in detail by Matthew Paris. The French forces fled back to London at that point, and more barons returned to the king's party. And in August of that year, 1217, a French fleet bringing reinforcements to Prince Louis, who was in England at the time, uh, was attacked by a royal fleet, an English fleet, and defeated. Louis was ready to sue for peace and left England. And there are no illustrations of the Battle of Chesterfield either. Not only no descriptions of it, but no illustrations. So these two pictures I've just shown you are of 13th century combats, just to give a bit of an idea. Battles at sea were like battles at land, on land. There were no broadsides. You could forget one lower. The idea was to get your ship as close as you could to the others and then swarm over the deck. Uh, and they fought out to hand on the decks. So there was nowhere to retreat at sea. So sea battles were often more bloody than land battles. Henry III, again. So a treaty was signed with the French, bringing an end 
to Louis' claim to the English throne, and Alexander II of Scotland was forced to remove his troops out of the north of England. Just another indication of how close it might have been. Uh, at one point, Alexander marched his whole army south, all the way from Scotland to Dover, to talk with Louis, and then back again. And the royal armies could do nothing about this whole Scottish army coming the length of the land. So Henry III's reign began with war. Okay, and it was about uh, four or five years before royal authority was settled. Uh, with the siege of Bedford, uh, you can see the, the royal standard flying over the castle of Bedford, and the fate of the garrison once they were lost. At one point, to make from the siege, uh, which il illustrates the context of the Battle of Chesterfield later on, uh, the occupier of Bedford Castle at this time was a man called Falk de Bavent. And he had actually been the commander of Lincoln Castle when the French were attacking it a few years earlier. And now here he is, in opposition to the throne, not wanting to hand his castle over. And he's particularly cross because the man who was meant to be having his castle at Bedford was someone who had been opposing the king in the, second, in the First Barrett's War. And so time and time again we'll meet nobles chopping and changing out for what they can get, taking up loyalty with the throne one year and then transferring it again next. And that happens as well at Chesterfield. The combatants of Chesterfield did the same. After the siege, Bedford Castle was destroyed. There's no castle in Bedford, and that's not the only castle we'll meet this evening that gets knocked down. So we've reached 1225, okay, 40 years to go. Okay. Over the Channel, the French monarchy were more powerful than ever, and they captured Gascony and Poitou, lands of the kingdoms of England, used to hold, uh, and so in January 20, 1235, uh, it was a determined that to try and conquer those countries, those lands back in France, a grant of £40,000 was given by the Parliament in those days, uh, not the same as Parliament nowadays, but those were nobles gathering to talk, that's where the Parliament comes from, Parley, um, the army crossed the channel, Gascony was retaken, but not Poitou, and in return for the Baron's support in this venture, the young King Henry, through his, his regents, reissued Magna Carta. Now, you all know about Magna Carta, 800th anniversary last year. Okay, this document laid down some kind of a vision of what kingship should be. Okay, and the expectation again here in 1235 from the Barons was that the king would rule according to ancient customs and laws, which in effect, would allow the barons to control and power in their fiefdoms. And thus would the, the coalition of crown and nobility be maintained. Things seem to start well. In 1227, Henry attained his majority and began to rule in his own name. By 1230, he was sufficiently confident to take advantage of a revolt of French nobles against the young King Louis. Okay, so it wasn't just the English kings who suffered from rebellions from their, their nobles. French had the same problem, and he set off across the channel to try and reclaim the lands of old. There's a picture of him again from Matthew Paris's Chronicle, crossing to France. It was a costly disaster. No major battle was fought. A truce was arranged with the French, and Henry came back to England. The major change, or the major effect in England, was that Henry's first minister, Hubert de Burr was replaced by uh, Peter de Roche. That's a French name, there's a bit of a clue there. Peter de Roche, he was Bishop of Westminster. De Roche had been Henry's tutor when he was young, but had been outmoved by Hubert when Henry came to the throne. Now de Roche was in the ascendancy. And whereas Hubert generally supported the English barons, de Roche drew his support from barons who were based over the channel and he rapidly appointed his friends to powerful positions within Henry's administration. Many of these were nobles from Poitou who fled what was going on in France. Because of this increasing influence, discontent simmered amongst the English barons, and there were a complete, repeated complaints that he was not ruling according to Magna Carta. And from this point on, Henry ruled without any of the major English nobles in positions of power. 
In 1235, just about this point, he visited Chesterfield on his way from Nottingham to Peveril Castle. So he filled the offices of state with his close friends, and particularly his relations, the relations of his wife, Eleanor of Provence. He married her in 1236, only 13 when she came to England. She gave birth to her first son, the future Edward I, only three years later at 16. Eleanor's relationship with Henry was initially troubled. She had her own family and friends from France, and she favoured different factions within the court. And she certainly antagonised the people of London. She claimed back payments on Queen's gold. So this is all the stuff I've been finding out. It's just awesome. uh, by which she would get a tenth of all the fines levied in London, straight to the, the Queen's coffers. Uh, by the time of the Second Baron's War, 1260s, when she tried to travel from the Tower up to Windsor by boat up the Thames, she was pelted by the Londoners with insults and stones. So she certainly wasn't a friend of the Londoners. But she cleaved her husband by the end of the reign, and she raised troops for him in France when the war began in the, 19, in the 1250s. She outlived her husband by 19 years, and when she died in 1292, she was buried in Amesbury. But the place of her burial is not known. She's the only English queen who has no marked grave. <coughs> By 1249, there were more Poitiers and Savoyards and Lusignans holding office in England, and Henry had not done anything to implement the reforms of 1245. In retaliation, opposition to his rule hardened. He had 30 parliaments between 1232 and 1257. He asked for taxes 12 times in that period, and he only got taxes once. The barons were not happy with him. He continued to try and intervene in Europe. He wanted to build a coalition of power with other, no, other, other royal families to attack the French, to encircle the French. Uh, and he even suggested going on a crusade at one point. So that's a standard tactic in the medieval period of trying to draw attention away from domestic problems. Let's all go on a crusade and sort things out there. He, uh, he also tried to make his second son, Edmund, <coughs> king of Sicily. Again, trying to make a network of, of allies around the continent. That failed as well. Uh, it was all to do with trying to get back at the French in stolen, as he thought, the lands in France. And of course that leads on next century into the Hundred Years' War. In 1258, matters came to a head. And it can be said at this point, that Siberia is coming back from France uh, in one of his expeditions that didn't work. In 1258, a group of barons marched into the parliament then being held at Westminster and forced the king and said, this is it, you really have to change now because we are seriously cross about this. Where in their arm? The king said, am I your prisoner? And they said, well, no, no, we need you to be king now, but effectively this was a coup d'etat. The coalition of crown and aristocracy had fallen apart. And so under the provisions of Oxford, that's a parliament later in June, with a crisis brewing on the Welsh marches, the nobles in Wales were kicking against the English uh, rule, Henry agreed to set up a council of 24 nobles to advise the king, in other words, to rule in his place. Uh, this parliament in Oxford was overseen by one Peter de Montfort, not a relation of the Simon that we're going to meet shortly, but Peter de Montfort was sort of the first speaker of parliament, and one of the themes of the 13th century is Parliament beginning to take some sort of shape uh, as things are changing from just being a council of lords and uh, nobles towards what we see now. So in Westminster later on that year, Henry and Prince Edward, his son, agreed that he would, they would abide by whatever the aforesaid barons should provide for the advantage and amendment of the realm. And one of those barons in that Council of 24 was Simon de Montfort. Uh, there's no contemporary image of Simon de Montfort, so there's his coat of arms instead. But Henry wriggled, Henry swirled, he didn't really do all that was old, and eventually the baron's patience was up. 
1263, and the Welsh were again threatening the English marshes, and members of Prince Edward's own household, aided by the Queen, were plotting with Simon de Montfort against the King. It's just impossible to untangle all the interests of the conflicts going on there. Just keep thinking power and control equals wealth. And that's the sort of the, the light waiting for this. The king and the rebellious barons gathered their forces, and with Edward back on his father's side at this time and leading the, the royalist army, and Simon de Montfort on the rebel side, they fought the Battle of Lewis. That's a picture from the 19th century, early 20th century. There's no pictures of the, the battle from that time. Henry and his son Edward were defeated, the rebels won, Simon de Montfort was in the ascendancy, and Henry and, uh, was forced to pardon these rebels, um, to reinstate the provisions of Oxford. He was effectively a figurehead, and they were both kept prisoner. So I said there's no image of Simon, but here's an image, an image of his wife, another Eleanor. Okay. I'm not getting into the Republican politics of the US with the wives of different candidates, not going there, but maybe we're going to towards Republican politics. That's an issue we can talk about. So far, this account has been pretty chronological. I've rattled my way through the 13th century. I'm going to go back in time a bit just to get another woman into the story. I've mentioned the king's wife, Eleanor. This is Simon's wife, Eleanor, because otherwise it's all men, his story. <sighs> Eleanor was no less a person than the sister of King Henry III, his younger sister. Okay. She had been married in 1224, at nine years old, to William Marshall, but he died six years later. And at that point, Eleanor and her governess took a vow of perpetual chastity. This was because she wished to avoid another arranged marriage and would, she hoped, preserve all her dowry possessions, okay, all her titles and lands. Although the status of women in the 13th century, and so widows and their property in the 13th century was so complicated, there was even a special bit of Magna Carta, all about widows and what should be done when, they, uh, when their husbands died, or when they became widows. However, she seems to have fallen in love with Simon, to have wanted to have children, and um, possibly have his support in obtaining her dowry possessions. They were still in dispute. So on the 7th of January in 1238, remember we've gone back in time a bit, Eleanor and Simon were married in secret by Walter, the king's chaplain, in the king's chapel. And the only other person present was the king himself. He was obviously happy for this marriage to take place, but it was a bit dodgy. You know, she sworn to perpetual chastity. Uh, Simon de Montfort, you know, not the major noble, but obviously the important person. So the marriage took place, and Henry gave Simon permission to go to the Pope and ask for forgiveness to, for marrying a woman pledged to chastity, which he got. Uh, he came back, and a few months later, uh, their son was born at Kenilworth Castle. We'll come back to Kenilworth a bit later on. And Henry the King, who was at Woodstock at the time, rushed up to Kenilworth to give his blessing to the young boy and give his permission for them to call him Henry. So now another Henry, Henry of Montfort. Simon's oldest son. So clearly the Montforts had at this time been high in the king's favour. But now in 1264, two years to go, Simon de Montfort was the power in the realm. You can find out if you want all about his parliament. He set up uh, in 1265 that included commoners, non-nobles from every county and from towns around the country. So that's, again, it's another step on the, on the road to a parliamentary democracy. And Simon is sometimes called the father of uh, parliament. And there's a, a plaque in America. <coughs> uh, but unfortunately, he seems to have blown it. He seems to have started behaving in just the ways that he was fed up with, and the other nobles were fed up with the way Henry was behaving. His sons swaggered around the country, it's described. Uh, they started holding themselves to castles and titles and land. Uh, he lost support of many nobles, uh, including the Earl of Gloucester. And Gloucester, it was, who engineered the escape of Prince Edward in the middle of 1265. So now the king's son is free, raises an army, and on the field of Evesham, 
In August 1265, Simon and his son Henry were killed. It's possible that they lost the battle because his other son Simon, that's confusing, you know, Simon the Younger, didn't get to the battle in time. Not to get to the details. So last year was the 750th anniversary of the Battle of Evesham. Much, much bigger affair than the Battle of Chesterfield. This is just to whet your appetite slightly and also to raise your hopes vainly. We're not going to have anything quite on this scale in vain this year. But they seem to have had a good day in August last year down in Evesham. Robert of Gloucester, one of the chroniclers at the time, described it as a murder of Evesham. For battle, it was none. Henry's body was mutilated on the field. Henry launched into a period of revenge, and in September, after the battle, at Parliament in Winchester, he disinherited everybody who had rebelled against him, including the wives and the widows of those rebels. Remember the widows? So, can we say that the Second Baron's War was won with the Battle of Evesham? Was that the end of it? Remember, it took the government of the young King Henry several years to regain control after the First Baron's War. But on that occasion, John had died. The real cause for the Baron's grief at the beginning of the century was gone. They were able to come back to the King's side. But in 1265, Henry III still had difficulties, still had problems, <laughs> dotted all over the country. The Baron's not going back to his, his side. One of those was a man called Adam de Gurdon. He had a castle in Hampshire on the road from Windsor to London. So quite a complicated bit of business for the king if he can't get from the capital city to his castle of Windsor. Uh, Prince Edward, the king's son, was uh, sent with an army to roust out to Gurdon. Uh, in May of 1266, Edward stormed de Gurdon's fort and met with him in personal combat. It seems to be quite, quite a battle. And his resolution so impressed the prince that his life was spared and he was sent as a prisoner to the queen. Now the rest of his men were happy. Was de Gurdon a rebel fighting for democracy? Was Simon de Montfort fighting for democracy? Within a few years, de Gurdon had brought his lands back from the crown and he went on to serve Henry III and then Edward, who had gone head to head with, as a loyal ally. ally. And the Oxford Dictionary of National, Biog National Bi Biography suggests that maybe de Gurdon's life might have contributed to the growth of the legend of Robin Hood at the time. A rebel, Old, brave, fearless, taking on the crown, but actually on the good side, really. It's an interesting thought. By the turn of the year, 1266, Henry is more conciliatory, and he's receiving his former rebels, his former rebel enemies. Uh, he's issuing safe conduct to people who want to come and make peace with him. Uh, and so they have able to find documents, the patent rolls from the time where he says uh, things like to receive into the king's safe conduct until Easter all others who in the disturbance had in the realm were against the king in any way, coming with them to the king to treat of their peace. So he's trying to make build some bridges, but not all the rebels will surrender. And appointments are made, for example, for barons to defend the parts of Westminster and the counties of Essex and Hartford as the king's enemies still make congregations and conspiracies. It's a fantastic language there. And in February, Henry of Almain, and he's the king's nephew, Almain because he's the son of the king of Germany. Now, the king of Germany is actually Henry's brother Richard, who's actually Earl of Cornwall. But that's all part of that network that Henry was trying to set up in Europe. Uh, so, Henry of Almain was sent with his wonderful neighbours, Peter de Bruce, John de Balliol, Ralph, son of Randolph, sounds like a nasty piece of work, Henry de Percy, Robert de Neville, John de Aville, watch out for that name, Richard Elliot, and so on, uh, all, and the King's son Edmund, ordered all of them to defend parts of the counties of York, Nottingham, and Derby. So that's the north in those days. That really is the north. If you're north of the Trent, you're definitely in the north. So these men were sent from, uh, from the king uh, to keep the peace in this part of the world. John David there mentioned, on the king's side there, sent with the king's son. He's coming back in a few minutes. And Henry orders all his army 
to meet with him in Oxford three weeks after Easter, so we're right in the middle now of 1266, with horses and arms and others, and if they cannot come personally, to spend their service on the day to go with the king against his enemies and rebels, the adherents of Simon de Montfort, sometime Earl of Leicester. The king's enemy and fellow and his party hold out against the king at the castle of Kenilworth. So there's this big castle, Kenilworth, uh, very, very tricky to attack, right, right in the middle of the country, and rebels have taken control of it. Simon's, uh, Simon's part of his uh, the earldom of Leicester, and they're holding out against the king. They are a real problem. When the king sent one of his messengers to try and sort things out, they sent the messenger back, bless one of his hands. So those who had taken Simon de Montfort's side had been completely disinherited. They had nothing to, to, to hold on to, so they seemed to have just caused trouble. It must have been very difficult for them, having been used to power and control, now trying to make what they could. Um, and we're going to see how some of those were in the Midlands. So Chesterfield. Why did the battle come to Chesterfield? And what was Chesterfield like in those times? In the good old days, when Borough Councils had money, they, this is Chesterfield Borough Council commissioned the history of Chesterfield in 1974. This is by Bestel, and it's got some fantastic details in the library, of course. Um, and if you want to really read the detail of what Chesterfield was like in those days, it's in there. Or there's a lecturer from Nottingham called Philip Ryder, who came a couple of years ago to do a talk about medieval Chesterfield here. Uh, I was away and I missed it, unfortunately. So that would be really good if we could get Philip Ryder back and give his talk on medieval Chesterfield. I could come and, and learn some more stuff. <coughs> Suffice it to say that the town uh, was much smaller, obviously, and the church in the centre of the town was not the church that we have now, not the Crooked Spire. No Crooked Spire in 1266. The leader of the rebels at that time was Robert de Ferris, and his, his power base was Duffield's Castle. He was the sixth Earl of Derby, and this was a big castle. It probably had the third largest keep in the country at the time. This is what it might look like, thanks to the National Trust. They've done these images. Uh, this is what it looks like now. <laughs> I learned a bit about this at Derbyshire Archaeology Day earlier this year. And you can see the stones there. They're covered with a kind of tar pitch. Uh, that was put on top of the uh, mixture to try and preserve the stonework. That was done quite a long time ago, and now the archaeologists are saying we shouldn't take that stuff off because that's archaeological itself now. <laughs> the stuff that we used to protect the stones is, is now part of the archaeology itself. Robert de Ferris is, uh, it's right, the, the castle was pulled down probably after the Battle of Chesterfield. We don't know exactly when. But it's probable that once uh, Robert de Ferris had lost the Battle of Chesterfield, uh, his castle was pulled down. He's not reported kindly. Uh, he seems to have held a particular grudge against Prince Edward, the king's son. Uh, when Robert's father died, he was still a minor, and so Prince Edward was given all his lands to look after until he became an adult. Um, so Prince Edward sold them to the queen, needing some money. Uh, and <laughs> That just must have annoyed Robert de Ferris. Apparently, of no one was Edward more afraid, said Robert of Gloucester. So I think he was quite a character, quite a powerful character. He continued to argue with, with Edward about who should have Pedal Castle and peak there. So after each of unusually, de Ferris was allowed to buy his lands back. Okay, obviously, the, uh, the king thought he was a noble worth keeping on his side. But here he is, by the spring of 1266, revolting again. He gathered his forces at Duffield and moved north to meet up with, oh, there he is, this is, with Baldwin Wake. Now, Baldwin Wake was the Lord of Chesterfield. And that had been in his hands since 1233. As it happened, actually, in May 1266, it wasn't in his hands because he'd been disinherited. And the Queen, Queen Eleanor, was Lord of Chesterfield at the time of our battle here. Uh, Edward Wake had been making trouble at Axo, the boggy, harsh area of Lincolnshire, where a number of rebels were holed up. Uh, he'd been given free, uh, sorry, uh, safe conduct out of there by the King. But here he is in Chesterfield, probably just making trouble. And coming south towards Chesterfield was a man called John Davil. Do you remember? He'd been sent on the King's side to keep the peace. 
in the north well he's obviously got fed up with that idea and he's heading south now his uh, his and was hood near thirsk and maybe he was robin hood maybe that's also part of building up the legend of robin hood at this time Daniel had also been axed home, but had also been given safe conduct. But shopping had changed all the time. And on his way south, he torched Sheffield on his way to Chesterfield. <laughs> and the leader of the royalist force was Henry Valway, the king's nephew, so we'll give him the royal coat of arms. Henry was a major ally of Prince Edward, and he, when, when he became king in 1272. Henry had not been at Evesham. Uh, and as I say, he'd been sent to the north of England to try and keep the peace. And another man in the uh, Royalist army was John de Warren, who was Earl of Surrey, a top notch noble. Uh, he went on to fight William Wallace at Stirling later on. He'd just been given £100 from the lands of the king's enemies. He was obviously even the king at the time. And what happened? What happened when they got here? Well, I'm going to draw an awful lot on an article by Samuel Peck, who was a Chesterfield antiquarian. Uh, in 1771, he got together all he could find about the Battle of Chesterfield. He summarised all the chronicles of what he'd written in Latin more than hundreds of years beforehand, and he presented an article called A Succinct and Authentic Narrative of the Battle of Chesterfield to the Society of Antiquities in 1771 on May the 16th. Note the date, May the 16th, the day after the date of the Battle of Chesterfield. Obviously, a man after my own part. Now, disregarding the date of the Battle of Chesterfield, it took place at Pentecost in 1266, and this year as well, Pentecost falls on the 15th of May. So, lots of quotes from, uh, from Peg's article and the chronicles that he found. So, Robert de Ferris moves up from Duffield to Chesterfield. Aldrin Wake's already there, and Dayville is coming south from the burning remains of Sheffield. But where was Henry Valway and the Royalist forces? Now, the traditional idea is that he moved north from Tutbury Castle. Okay? That's what I found in a lecture from 1887. Uh, but I don't think he was there. Not, I can't find any other references apart from this 19th century lecture to Henry. Uh, of Albany being at Tutbury. Certainly it was one of Robert de Ferris's castles, but it had been pulled down a couple of years earlier. So I don't think there's any reason for Henry to be there. I'd like to suggest a different narrative. Remember, he and lots of other people had been ordered north to defend parts of the counties of York and Nottingham and Derby. And the next mention of him is in an entry in the patent roll in May the 5th, so very, very soon, just before our Battle of Chesterfield. Henry III had moved north to Northampton. Clearly something was going to happen in the Midlands. And he sent out an order to Henry Valmain and others to meet him at Northampton to go against Kenilworth. He wrote, Henry's son of the King of Almain, John de Baliol, Robert de Bruce, Peter de Bruce, Robert de Neville, and the rest of the barons and the knights in the north, to come with horses and arms to Northampton on the eve of the whole of the morrow of Holy Trinity, on which day the king proposes to set out with his whole army, which is within Northampton, towards the castle of Kenilworth to attack his enemies and take that castle. So the king now in the Midlands, ready to take that Kenilworth castle. And so I think he's got heavy the army in the north, and he orders him south with his army, army on the way to taking Kenilworth castle. So I think that the muster of rebels at Chesterfield was probably opportunistic. They must have got wind of this threat to Kenilworth because the patent rolls were open. They weren't the closed rolls. They were open so everybody could read them and tell people about what was in them. So I think news must have got to Deferra's, to Baldwin Wake, and they perhaps gathered in Chesterfield with a view to cutting off Dayville, stopping him coming south to join the king at Northampton and to reduce the threat to Kenilworth Castle. So, coming from the north. However, the rebels' scouting was not very good, and it seems as though Henry was able to take them by surprise. According to the Annals of London Chronicle, Prince Henry of Armagh made such haste that he surprised the rebels in their quarters and killed the greatest part, took De Ferris prisoner, and dispersed the rest with wakes from Dayville, hardly escaping, just getting away with the skin of their teeth. In the Chronicle of Thomas Wykes, 
The royalist attack was made with use of covered wagons. Did the attackers make their way towards the town in them, or even into the town in wagons, and then jump out of the rebels? That would also fit in with the suggestion that it was a surprise. And White goes on to say that many of the rebel leaders, including Baldwin Wake and Henry of Hastings, were actually hunting outside Chesterfield on May the 15th. They weren't ready for a battle. They were out hunting. They wouldn't have been armed particularly heavily. Perhaps wouldn't have had very many men with them. Perhaps the royalist royal force surprised those who were hunting and drove them off before they assaulted the town itself. And John Daville seemed made a sortie, a charge out from the town, and burst through the attackers, and unhorsed Sir Gilbert Hansard before making off. So at this point, the Royalist troops would have entered Chesterfield, where De Ferrers and his men stood at bay. Remember Roger Wendover's description of the Battle of Lincoln? Sparks and thunder from clashing metal and the sound of swords against helmets. What would it have been like on the streets of Chesterfield that day? The Annals of London Chronicle says, They killed the soldiers and many others. Thomas White's speaks of countless people devoured by hostile swords. In the annals of Dunstable, there was a great slaughter. What would it have been like on the streets of Chesterfield? We really have only our imaginations to go on. We just don't really know. I find it impossible to imagine that someone would sharpen up a piece of metal with the intention of sticking it into someone else. Hard to imagine. The Royalist forces were victorious. They were probably better trained, better led, probably more experienced than been in the north trying to keep the peace. De Ferrers was captured. Robert of Gloucester says that he suffered from gout, quite debilitating illness, and he'd been through bloodletting that day, which was the standard cure for just about anything in those days. Thomas Wikes, writing a few years later, said he was ignobly taken. I think that probably means without much of a fight. And the reference to De Ferrer's being betrayed by a woman comes in a chronicle written about a hundred years later. So when he was captured, De Ferrer's was loaded with chains, iron chains, in other words, shackled, and sent to Windsor. It's a nice connection between the Latin for iron, ferris, and De Ferrer's. The fighting was over, and the rebels dispersed. Ford, in his 1839 history of Chesterfield, describes De Ferris as the gallant, brave young Earl. So he spoke nicely of him. He was only 27 years at the time of the battle. But I think De Ferris was a man of his own time, and along with other barons, pursued a career largely aimed at his own aggrandizement. How much was he, or even Simon de Montfort, really motivated by democracy and of creating a different form of government? I think it's very hard to claim. I think his actions show that his own wealth and power came first. His decision once again to set himself against the crown sealed his fate, and he was the last Ferris Earl of Derby. In the aftermath of the battle, there are references to all the major individuals involved. Robert de Ferris was eventually allowed a small portion of his estates, and he lived out the rest of his life trying to regain more. John David and Baldwin Wake went back to Axone in Lincolnshire and they continued their fighting there before surrendering finally. Baldwin Wake was re granted the lordship of Chesterfield. Other rebels from Montfort's army made their way to Kenilworth and in June, so a month after our battle of Chesterfield, Henry III besieged the castle. It was a great effort. This was one of the most big, uh, lengthy and complicated sieges of medieval England. Uh, the castle was surrounded by masses of water. Huge siege engines were brought in, and eventually the castle was taken. Or rather, the castle surrendered. It wasn't taken. The rebels surrendered. Henry of Almain, who led the royalists at uh, Chesterfield, joined Prince Edward on a crusade, and off they went. And whilst Edward was out of the country, Henry III died in 1272. And Edward returned, not, pro not promptly, he took his time uh, to take up the throne. So obviously, royal authority had been established by 1272. It was okay for the king to be dead and the heir of the throne to come back in good time, at his own time, to take up the throne. But Henry of Almay was not so lucky. In 1271, 
had to deter Bo in Italy, he was recognised by two of Simon de Montfort's exiled sons, Guy and Simon the Younger. So these men had fled England after their father's death, and they recognised Henry of Almain at this little village in Italy. Henry of Almain fled into the church, and he was pursued by these two men. Henry cried out for mercy, and Guy he said to him, you have no mercy on my father and brothers. And they stabbed Henry to death in the church. This murder shocked Europe. And in his inferno, written in the very early part of the 14th century, Dante put Guy in the seventh circle of hell for it, in a river of boiling blood. And as for the citizens of Chesterfield, we come at last to the men of Brampton. There's the church in Viterbo. On the last page of the Chesterfield Parish Register book, volume 1, 1558 to 1635, there's a memorandum written in the back page. In Latin, written by the priest of that time, Matthew Wallington, who was vicar of Chesterfield, 1616 to 1638, which is a copy, he says, of some writing which he's had written, which he wrote, on the wall of the vicarage. Okay, and he copied down that wall, that writing from the wall, into the back of the parish register book. And it's Matthew Wallington's attempt to explain uh, the rights held by the vicar of Chesterfield, in particular relating to the dependent chapels of Brampton and Wigginworth. Matthew Wallington explains some of the duties of those chapels and of the nearby inhabitants and what those chapels must deliver and pay to the vicar of Chesterfield. So it's all about power, money, authority again. Here's the vicar of Chesterfield grumpy with his outlying hamlets and chapelries who are not giving him what he wants. <coughs> Philip Ryan, who I mentioned earlier, comments that the inclusion in this memorandum of the long deserted hamlet of Langley and a reference to the Battle of Chesterfield and the idea of shared responsibility between the hamlets for maintaining the wall of the burial ground, all these point to a medieval origin for this text. So it could be a very old idea, a very old, and this reference to the Battle of Chesterfield is in there. That's Brampton Church. Bigger than it probably was then. So, written on the wall of the vicarage, and now in the back of the Chesterfield Parish Register, is this bit, or this is part of it, and it says that the inhabitants of Brampton were accustomed to make their part of the wall of the burial ground of Chesterfield. In other words, now, 300 years later, you people of Brampton should still be looking after the wall of the churchyard in Chesterfield. It's your job. And just point that out. Just remember that in the time of the war of Lord Simon de Montfort, they, the men of Brampton, betook themselves to that part of the wall which they built, being unwilling to allow others to be admitted there. So Pegg quotes this in his article from 1771, and he clearly understands that to be referring to the Battle of Chesterfield, the men of Brampton being in the town on their part of the church wall on the day. Did they go into the town to fight? Certainly, Simon de Montfort was Earl of Leicester, it's part of the world. De Ferris was Earl of Derby, even closer, Baldwin Wake had been the Lord of Chesterfield. They must have recruited their troops from somewhere. But I don't think the men around meant to fight. It seems to me they went to protect their investment, the bit of the wall that they were responsible for, just in case it got damaged, because they would have to patch it up later. So Wellington's transcribed this text, possibly from an old document, sometime onto the wall of his house, and then he's copied it from the wall of his house into the parish register book. And so we have this unique feature of the Battle of Chesterfield where it actually mentions some of the people in the town, maybe not competence, but actually being mentioned as being there on the day. Pegg used that reference in his article in 1771. And in 2003, Richard Bunting wrote an article in Reflections magazine about the Battle of Chesterfield, and that caught my eye. What a great idea, it seems to me, for men and women and children, not just the Brampton, but of all the borough, to come together in, 12, 16, in 2016, 20, yes, 2016, yes, uh, <laughs> got to model with all these dates, and set about creating a community event 
to mark the 750th anniversary of, battle, anniversary of the Battle of Chesterfield. And that's what the second part of this evening is going to be about. Thank you.